We're going to talk about crush injuries today. And this is something that most likely you don't see very frequently in your emergency department and your ICU. It's a fairly infrequent event. And I would be bold enough to say that it's a halo event. And so crush injuries for me tend to go into the category of these high acuity, low occurrence events, right? So we don't see a lot of crush injuries in the emergency department, but when we do, they're incredibly ill. They need a lot of care, a lot of our time. And so I think it's worth reviewing what we need to be worried about, what we're living in fear of when these crush injuries come in. So what is a crush injury in medical terms? If we're going to really deep dive into this, it's getting smushed is what you're going to uh, find in the literature, any sort of smush injury. The majority of crush injuries worldwide actually come from earthquakes. So we don't see a lot of those on the East Coast. I don't have a lot of earthquake victims in Philadelphia. Uh, but worldwide, these massive earthquakes, particularly in countries that uh, don't have the infrastructure that we have here, are going to have earthquake injuries, which are going to be mass casualty events. You're going to have many patients with crush injuries. However, increases in terrorism, increases in war zone situations, we're going to see more crush injuries from building collapse, things of that nature. More locally, as long as we continue not to have too many terrorist incidents in Philadelphia, we tend to see things like MVCs, if you live more rurally, you're going to see farm accidents. And we already know we're like really scared of farmers coming to the emergency department because things are about to get real, real when that happens. So farm equipment uh, always keeps us on our toes. And the thing that you might not think of as frequently, which has been an occurrence over the past several years, are actually crush injuries from crowd compression. So any of those incidents where a lot of people are in one space, stampedes, Anything like that where the bodies, even though they're still vertical, are getting pushed together, those are still considered crush injuries because it's the same mechanism of injury. I always want to know what's happening pre-hospital. I love talking to my pre-hospital colleagues. In crush injuries, you need to maybe take an extra couple of minutes because what happened pre-hospital is actually really, really important to these particular injuries. So... One of the most important things is probably going to be extrication time. That makes a big difference, right? Have they been under the rubble for hours at this point? Or did you get them out right away from an MVC? How long did it take to actually get them from the scene of the injury out of the scene and then to your hospital? If you get any sort of warning about this incident coming in, mass casualty, earthquake, terrorist attack, anything like that, you should be prepared, expecting possible field amputations. If they're not able to extricate the patient from the crush site, they may need to do field amputation. So that's something that should at least be on your mind, something that you're prepared for if you know a crush injury is coming in or if there's a mass casualty event. And this should also make you start thinking about whatever protocol your institution has in place for mass casualties, right? Are we activating MTP? Are we getting more staff in? What are we doing for the fact that an entire building collapsed? I promise this is the only picture of a cell you're going to see. <laughs> Don't be scared. It's all right. I do want to mention that the primary reason that most people have extensive multi-organ injuries is because of direct cell damage. This is going to cause release of some of our favorite characters, and they're going to go on to wreak havoc throughout the entire body. So these are kind of our, our big three culprits here. And when you're thinking about what's going to happen in the future, these are the guys who are really causing a lot of the damage. So just to talk about language and terminology for one brief second, we talk about crush injuries. That's what happened to the patient. All right. They got crushed. They have a crush injury. However, We'll start using the term crush syndrome to describe the systemic manifestations of that injury. So once you have a crush injury and you develop systemic issues from it, now you have crush syndrome. I know that the ICD-10 folks will be really pleased that I made that distinction. So how do we assess these patients when they come to the emergency department? 
the first thing that I want to sadly inform all of the folks who work in the emergency department is that this is not a one and done patient. Unless they are so injured and happen to be at a trauma center that they go directly from your ER to the trauma bay or, or to the uh, OR with the trauma team, you get to reevaluate this patient. You get to reassess them. You get to reevaluate them again. You get to do it a third time. Your whole afternoon is blown, my friends. You are spending a lot of time with this patient. And this is because crush injuries are very exciting from a time perspective. Bad things can happen right away at the site. They can happen a few minutes later. They can happen a few hours later. So unfortunately, unless you are in a really high resource area, these are patients that you're going to be really checking in on, going back in the room, thinking about for the rest of your time on the shift. And you're probably going to be signing it out to someone if you live in a rural area and you're trying to transfer this patient out. The other thing that I want to talk about before we get into the assessment of the actual crush injuries is to remember that the vast majority of these patients are also suffering from blunt trauma, right? The mechanism of their crush injuries is such that they may not just have injuries specifically re related to crush syndrome. So we're still evaluating them for closed head trauma, pneumothorax, signs of internal hemorrhage. And those are not something that we're going to discuss today because that is a blunt trauma issue and not specific to crush injury. But you still need to run them like a trauma in most cases. All right. We're going to talk about a couple of organ systems here, and this is a review of all of the many things you get to think about and keep in the forefront of your mind on these very critically ill patients. So the first one is pulmonary, and some of these patients, particularly patients who are in the upright compression injuries, are going to have some concerning signs for traumatic asphyxiation. Anything that crushes the chest puts you at risk for actually suffocating to death from that compression injury, even if you don't have the associated head trauma. You're going to see signs like cerebral edema, cerebral facial edema. You're going to see subconjunctival hemorrhage, petechial rash above the site of the injury. And that should start giving you a little bit of anxiety if you don't already have it, that this patient's airway is uh, compromised because of the traumatic injury and the asphyxiation issue. These patients can also go on to develop ARDS. And so that's a fun thing for you to look forward to. They're probably not going to be in gross ARDS when they come to the emergency department. But the direct trauma, the resuscitation, there are multiple reasons that they may go on to develop respiratory compromise that's not directly related to their immediate traumatic injury. So you have to keep an eye on their respiratory status throughout their stay, of course. I hate to break in here, but if you are enjoying this lecture right now, then you want to check out the entire Recess X reunion filmed live in Philadelphia 2024. There are over 60 talks that you can watch on replay for life. Right now, we have a coupon that gets you 20% off that entire package. Again, 20% off to watch the entire conference for life. So if you're enjoying this video and you want to watch lots more, go to the link below and sign up. Now back to the video. Cardiac is, in my opinion, the most exciting thing that can happen to a patient. These are patients who can have a ventricular event at any time. In fact, 80% of patients who are victims of a crush injury such as an earthquake, 80% of those patients die before they ever get to the hospital. So we're talking about a relatively low number of folks who even make it into your emergency department. And someone came up with a fun name of uh, the smiling victim when they come out of the patient or out of the uh, extricated site because they come out smiling. They've finally been saved. The reperfusion event that happens when the heavy object has been lifted off of them, when the rubble has been removed, when the car has been pulled away from them, causes a release of the potassium, the phos, the myoglobin, and all of this rapid reperfusion that immediately puts them into ventricular fibrillation. So they're smiling, they're talking, thank you, you saved me. And then they just drop dead right in front of you and they never make it to the hospital. So these are folks who, of course, need to be on the monitor. You need to have a high suspicion, a high concern for a ventricular event. The big thing I think that most people think of when talking about folks who have crush injuries is acute renal failure. We're worried about 
tubular necrosis from the myoglobin that's released from the direct cell damage. We're worried about volume loss and third spacing. So a lot of folks who end up coming into the emergency department with crush injuries do end up having acute renal failure and up to 50% of those folks will go on to need nut dialysis. So this is something that you need to keep an eye out. If their first creat is normal, it probably won't be for long. So you need to keep an eye on that. Get your nephrologists involved a little bit earlier than you might otherwise, because you're probably going to see a rapid increase in those numbers. From a metabolic standpoint, of course, the thing that we are most nervous about is this hyperkalemia. And again, you are not going to see this necessarily, depending on extrication time, on their very first blood draw. You will have to meet this patient multiple times. You will have to reevaluate them. You'll have to reorder labs, okay? And so this, these are patients that I would consider drawing Q2 labs on, especially in the first few hours while they're in your emergency department, while you are trying to find placement for them. Because of the lactic acid release from the muscle and tissue ischemia from the direct injury, they're also likely to become acidotic again during their stay with you. So you need to be keeping an eye on their acidosis. If you are already treating their hyperkalemia with bicarb, then great. That might also help their acidosis. Uh, but this is something, again, that's likely to develop during their time with you. Finally, I think the thing that we all worry about and possibly see a little bit more frequently in our day-to-day -day practice is rhabdo. And we're talking more about those compression injuries that involve extremities. And so this is, again, something that you're going to need to reevaluate and have a high suspicion for, because once this starts, the cascade of other things is going to get worse, which is why I really feel like we're in a always sunny situation. Everything's connected. Everything's going to make the other thing worse. And you're going to be on this for kind of a long time. So you're going to look a little bit like that at the end of your shift. All right. Now that we're all properly terrified of what's coming with our crush injuries, let's talk about how to manage it successfully. I think I'm legally not allowed to give a talk about emergency medicine, critical care resuscitation without saying the first three letters of the alphabet. So... Airway management, you're going to manage this like any other airway, okay? There's nothing too exciting about this, with the exception of if there is a compression injury to the neck or face. Again, this is most likely going to be similar to other blunt traumas that you've managed in the past, breathing. If you decide to intubate them, you're going to have a high suspicion, as we talked about, for ARDS. But otherwise, there's nothing too exciting that you shouldn't expect with any blunt trauma. Circulation is where things get a little bit uh, spicier. These are folks who are going to need pretty active resuscitation outside of their airway. And so, as we talked about, one of the big things that you are going to need to manage in the emergency department if these patients are with you for any length of time is assessing for rhabdo. Even if you don't see signs of rhabdo, you should be aggressively resuscitating these patients. They should get a lot of fluid. And some of the studies have shown that due to third spacing, signs of shock, all of these things, patients can uh, be down by or require about 12 liters in the first 24 to 48 hours. So we're really going pretty aggressively with the fluid resuscitation. Don't wait until they're already showing signs of being behind. Rhabdo, of course, leading to compartment syndrome, you're going to need to be reassessing their particularly lower extremities because a higher rate of crush injuries happen to the legs. We know that these are at high risk for compartment syndrome. So you're looking for all of the P's, you're reassessing their pain, and if you've already intubated them, then you need to be even more cognizant of the fact that they're not going to be able to give you some of those warning signs that they're developing compartment syndrome. If you are in a low resource area, I want to take a poll. If you're in a low resource area or you have a long transport time, you don't have surgery in house, you're in community medicine and it's midnight, how many people here would be willing to do a fasciotomy on a patient if you didn't have a way to get them out of there and they needed it? How many people? All right. I'd do it. Cut them. But I did just leave the procedural workshop, so I might be a little bit knifier than the average person. <laughs> These are folks that will need access to a surgeon or you with a knife if things are getting real dire. But you need to, again, once we start seeing signs of rhabdo, we're looking at dark urine, we're watching the CK for elevation. Our next thought should be, what are we going to do when we actually develop compartment syndrome? And finally, these patients are very likely to develop shock. 
two different kinds. The first kind may be hemorrhagic. However much blood they left at the scene, you may need to replace for them. And then, as we discussed earlier, the distributive shock from the third spacing and uh, all of the tissue damage that's happening to different parts of their body that have been affected. Take home points. I want to reiterate that you have to spend a lot of time with their patient, with this particular patient. Get to know their likes, their dislikes, their hobbies. You have to reassess them. You need to do re evaluations of their extremities, their personality, their respiratory status, their social security number. Okay, you're going to get to know this patient well, so let's just go ahead and resign ourselves to it now. All of my peers who are in critical care who are working in the ICU, I know you guys do this at baseline. I'm, I'm like a hit it and quit it sort of doctor. So uh, for me, I have to remember, let's circle back and actually uh, reevaluate the patient. While we're reevaluating this, we are continuing to think about their extremities, okay? So you need to be reevaluating pulses. You need to be feeling their feet. We're getting touchy feely. We know what they started. Feeling a little warm. Now we're a little bit cooler. This pulse isn't as strong because this is a uh, super high risk situation for crush injury patients. We're going to redraw labs. I'm so sorry. Just put in the Q2 hour order. And talk about it with your nurse. Let them know why you're doing this so that you don't make an enemy. We're not out here looking to make enemies of folks, right? But these folks will need repeat BMPs, repeat CKs, possibly repeat hemoglobins, depending on the extent of their injuries. And even if they're just going to be boarding in your ED, that does, I mean, I know we think like they're boarding. So like, I'm done with this. They have an admission. They have a disposition. In this case, you're probably not. So go ahead and just order standing labs so that you can continue to, to monitor whether or not they're decompensating. And finally, I think that there are a lot of situations, particularly in the world of trauma, where, you know, we manage things for a few minutes, we kind of tie it off in a very messy looking bow, and then we hand it off to our trauma colleagues. Maybe we hand it upstairs to our critical care teams. But because this is such a complex, multifactorial, multi-organ system, issue. This is really an opportunity for us, uh, certainly in the emergency medicine field, definitely pre-hospital and certainly in critical care as well, to work together and really provide a difference to these patients by managing them, not just for the first 10 minutes that they come, not just that first set of orders, but all the way through expecting for the worst to happen so that we can help manage that. 